Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. May 24th, 2018. The Kuna Report is powered by Kelly Financial Services. Cleaning up your financial bull. Get the peace of mind that you deserve at Kelly Financial Services. 104 here on the great WRKO. Okay, we've got retired Colonel Douglas McGregor. He's about to join us. I just want to give a, um, a quick, uh, just a quick update. So uh, a heads up. We are going to continue, obviously, uh, talking about North Korea. Huge story. After the show, 4.15, please join us for our rally that's going to be held to impeach Judge Feely in front of the J. Michael Ruain Judicial Building on Federal Street in Salem. Uh, we're going to kick it off at about 4.15. You can also, if you want to take the commuter rail, and you may want to, it's the Salem stop on the Rockport Newberry Port line. It's about a three, five minute walking distance. Uh, there's a parking garage as well right across the street. Please, Cooner Country, I hope to see as many of you there. Okay, my friends, as you know, President Trump just a couple hours ago announced that he is canceling the historic summit with Rocket Man, North Korea's dictator, Kim Jong-un. It is a huge decision with profound ramifications. And joining us now to talk about it, we've had him on before, Colonel Douglas McGregor, a retired colonel. He is the author of Margins of Victory. He's also a combat veteran. He has actually seen fighting. He's a war hero and a great patriot. Uh, colonel McGregor, thank you so much for coming on the Cooner Report. Hi, how you doing, Jeff? I'm good. Colonel, I've got to ask you right out of the gate, what do you make of President Trump's decision to essentially cancel the summit? Well, the champagne bottles uh, are popping their courts inside uh, Washington, D.C. The, the swamp is uh, celebrating. Defense stocks uh, are rising. Uh, people, generally speaking, other than the president, uh, are extraordinarily happy. I think the president was in a in a very difficult position. Uh, Mr. Bolton's remarks uh, about uh, the Libyan scenario for North Korea were devastating. And uh, his remarks were followed up by a number of actions in the Department of Defense by Mattis uh, involving overflights and exercises that sent a message to North Korea that Mr. Trump's overtures were not serious. And ultimately, the foreign minister last night in North Korea made remarks that were considered bellicose and unacceptable, but they were once again about Mr. Bolton's uh, remarks as the national security advisor. So at this point, I don't know that President Trump had too much leeway. Uh, he could go forward, but the only way he could go forward to that summit and be taken seriously was to fire John Bolton. And he did not do that. So under the circumstances... Uh, he decided not to press ahead. Colonel, let me just play devil's advocate for a second. Um, what Trump, what President Trump is arguing is this, and I want to hear your, your answer, that the leadership in North Korea had ripped into Mike Pence, that they had insulted him, they had called him all kinds of names. He says that their leadership became increasingly hostile, not friendly. Uh, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, just, I mean, I think maybe an hour ago, came out and said that the Kim, that Kim Jong Un, that Rocket Man, had essentially ghosted the administration. That they kept sending, you know, letters and emails trying to prepare the summit, and they were getting nothing back from the North Koreans. That the North Koreans were fundamentally never serious about this, and that Trump could not allow his vice president to be so openly, openly mocked and ridiculed in the way that they were doing. What do you say to that argument? Well, the North Koreans demolished uh, the first set of nuclear facilities, and they did it in a very public manner. Uh, they have systematically abandoned all of their missile tests. They have taken concrete actions to signal their readiness to do business. And what I think you will now see is that uh, the president of South Korea, will press ahead with uh, Mr. Kim in North Korea and reach effectively the arrangements that we were going to preside over. Uh, so I don't think this is going to change the course uh, of action on, on the peninsula at all. Uh, I don't know why uh, Vice President Pence 
stupidly invoked once again the Libyan scenario the way he did, other than to conclude that Pence, like Bolton and uh, virtually everybody else surrounding the president, was determined to sabotage this summit. So again, I, I think the president acted with a very heavy heart uh, because he knew there was an opportunity to affect a strategic change. But under the circumstances, given the actions of the people around him and the statements made last night, uh, I, I think he felt he had no, uh, no choice. Uh, but I don't think the president is happy because he's known ever since he met with President Xi earlier in the year that there was an opportunity to disengage from the conflict on the peninsula and to do so in a way that would promote good relations between the United States and Asia in general, uh, including China. That opportunity has slipped away. But uh, the direction is clear. China is, is no interest whatsoever in a nuclear-capable North Korea. And the Chinese will back President Moon and what he is going to now try to do on his own. And I think he'll be successful. The real question is, where do we end up as a result of all of this? And hopefully, we will not obstruct President Moon. Because, once again, if the people surrounding President Trump try to obstruct uh, denuclearization on the peninsula, we actually risk down the line being thrown off the peninsula. And I don't think Americans understand any of it. But most important, and this is something your, your listeners need to understand, don't pay attention to what Americans have to say about this. Look at the Korean press. Look at the Japanese press. Look at what the Chinese are saying. And right now, Mr. Trump really looks weak because they find it incomprehensible that he would tolerate a national security advisor in his midst who openly contradicted him in what he wanted to achieve in Northeast Asia. What do you say to the argument, Bolton's made this argument, Mike Pence has made this argument, the Wall Street Journal editorial page has made this argument, that yes, they demolished that nuclear site, but that's because the nuclear site itself had pretty much collapsed on its own. So that was a, a phony well, concession. If, if, Colonel, if just you want, accept that or, If you accept that argument, then there was never any valid nuclear threat to begin with, was there? Ah, okay, that's interesting. Okay, that's interesting. And what do you say then to the second argument that they make? That the Libya comparison, they didn't mean overthrowing Gaddafi in 2011. They meant in 2003 that how they had denuclearized Libya, where we literally sent our own people in and literally physically hauled out all of that WMD program. So they weren't talking Libya overthrow Gaddafi 2011. They were talking Libya 2003, the actual denuclearization. What do you say to that argument? In the last days of World War II, in May of 1945, General Patton, who commanded the Third Army, maintained as many as 50,000 German soldiers under arms and talked openly of employing these German troops with his own against the Soviets and marching east. As a result of that, he was relieved by uh, then-General Eisenhower because his comments were absolutely inconceivable to anyone in Washington that had already reached arrangements with Moscow, whether we liked them or not, uh, concerning the division of Germany and Europe. Now, what if Eisenhower had simply said, well, that's fine, George, go ahead and do what you want. What would the Soviets at that point have done with 15 million troops sitting in Eastern Europe across from us? Uh, the point is very, it's, it's got to be understood. It, it doesn't matter what Bolton now says, or Pence now says, or anyone else now says. What matters was a simple invocation of something that happened. We went ahead and agreed with Qaddafi uh, to dismantle his nuclear capability. He went along, he cooperated with us, and then suddenly, out of the blue, we decided to destroy him and remove him from power, creating chaos in the process. If you're sitting in North Korea and you hear this scenario invoked, your immediate reaction is, why should I reach any agreements with Washington? They are completely untrustworthy. The only solution at that point for the President of the United States, if he wanted to press ahead and make this successful, was to fire John Bolton on the spot. He didn't do it. And we are where we are as a result. 
Um, Colonel, I want to ask you two, I mean, fascinating, I want to ask you two follow-up questions. Do you think that denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, and in particular, defanging the North Korean regime, do you think it's realistic and viable? Oh, absolutely. First of all, just stop and consider for a minute. People continue to impute great capability to North Korea that it doesn't have. Only 3% of the roads in North Korea are paved. Just think about that. North Korea's GDP, if it has any at all that we can detect, lags behind Ethiopia, a sub-Saharan African state, in a region of the world in Northeast Asia where North Korea is surrounded by juggernauts in the economic sense. North Korea is a dying state. That's what Donald Trump discovered when he talked with Xi. Xi and he both understand it's dying. How do you manage a dying state? Will you help it to die quietly? You don't provoke it, lest it might strike out and do more damage. And that's what Donald Trump was trying to do, knowing full well that the place is, is on the ropes. Unfortunately now, China is in a very difficult position because it has pushed the North Koreans into doing this. I think that it will still happen because of President Moon in South Korea and also because in Tokyo, people also want it to happen. So we'll end up ultimately being irrelevant to the outcome. Then the question is, where do we sit in? And we don't. There will be no requirement for our military presence in South Korea. There really isn't now. Now we'll just look foolish. That's the bad news. And that's why the only way that this could continue in the future, the only way a summit could occur is for President Trump to fire John Bolton. He's obviously stuck with Pence, but he can tell the vice president to shut up and color, which is the vice president's job in any case. But Bolton will have to go. Unless Bolton goes, we are not going to have any credibility in Asia with anyone to do anything. Colonel, one final question. Uh, we're talking, by the way, with retired Colonel Douglas McGregor, uh, a, uh, a retired, I mean, he's a veteran, a combat veteran. He's the author of Margins of Victory. You've seen him on Tucker Carlson's show. He's been obviously on our show uh, in the past. Uh, Colonel, you mentioned very at the beginning of this interview, you said they're popping champagne corks in the swamp, in Washington. Uh, the establishment loves this move. Why are they popping champagne corks, in your view? Remember that President Trump is hated and despised, whether it's the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the L.A. Times, it doesn't make any difference. He's despised everywhere by the mainstream media and, and by the political elites because he represents the true potential for change. He always threatened everyone in Washington because Washington is all about the status quo. He threatens to disrupt the flow of money to all of the usual suspects. Why do you think the defense stocks soared today on news that there will be no summit? No one in the Defense Department, no one in the defense establishment, no one in the defense industries is interested in arrangements that would make our presence on the Korean Peninsula unnecessary. No one is thinking strategically about what is in the interest of the United States, about the fact that we simply cannot afford any longer to be everywhere. Instead, they think exclusively in terms of what will line their pockets. So the politicians and their don donors are all in the same boat. Trump must be obstructed everywhere all the time. He has now capitulated whether or not he realizes it uh, to the swamp. The swamp is winning. Um, Colonel, there's a, a story up on Drudge, uh, the Drudge Report, that Trump now says if Kim Jong-un should lash out or retaliate in any way for the cancellation of the summit, that our military is ready. Uh, <laughs> what, what do you make of those statements on the part of the president? Well, the president always reassures potential opponents as well as the American people that the American military is ready. But we're not ready. We're not ready to fight a major war anywhere in the world today. Trump knows that. That's why he is continuing to withdraw our forces from Syria. He's trying to get us out of the way. He talked about rebuilding the military. The truth is we don't need to rebuild the old force. We need to build a new one. These are the things that he knows in the back of his mind. But he is trying to make 
or let's put it put it this way: he's putting a happy face on a dead rat. North Korea is not going to retaliate because North Korea has nothing with which to retaliate. That's why I said earlier the North Koreans will now work with South Korea towards the arrangement that we wanted to begin with, and they will be backed by China. The danger for us is really our own bellicosity, that we do stupid things in the South China Sea or stupid things in the North China Sea, that we provoke somebody somewhere. Because right now we don't have the air power. We don't have the naval power. If you look at the United States Air Force, the chief of staff of the United States Air Force wants to bring back 1,000 pilots who are retired on active duty. That's because we have so few aircraft ready to fight and too few pilots to fly them. So think about that. No, we are not ready for a major war anywhere. The U.S. Army couldn't fight its way out of a wet paper bag right now. All the forces that we do have ready to go and do anything are too light and would be quickly destroyed in any major collision. So the answer is no. There's not going to be any retaliation. We're going to see these events move forward without us. We have been talking with Colonel Douglas McGregor. He is the author of Margins of Victory. Uh, Colonel, we'll have you on again next Thursday at 105. Does that work? Well, we'll see if I'm in, in town. If I'm in town, I'll absolutely... Let's try to make it happen again. Colonel, I really okay. appreciate your analysis. Thank you so much, sir, and God bless you. Sure. Bye -bye. Take care. 617-266-6868. Okay. Uh, you heard the colonel. I, boy, oh boy, I mean, just unloaded on Bolton. Is Bolton responsible, in your view, for the collapse of the summit between North Korea and the United States? What do you make of Trump's decision to cancel the summit? And in the end, will North Korea be denuclearized? And the Nobel Peace Prize, it was in Trump's hands. Did he just kiss it away? 617-266-6868. Your reaction next. 126 here on the great WRKO. Okay, join Relay for Life. Help the American Cancer Society fund cancer research, free rides to chemo, free places to stay near hospitals. Register or donate today at RelayForLife.org. Okay, just a quick heads up to everybody. The rally to impeach Judge Feely. We are now about two hours, 45 minutes away. Uh, please, if you can, I'm urging all of you a call to arms. Join us at the J. Michael Ruane Judicial Building on Federal Street in Salem. We're going to try to kick it off at 415. You can, uh, there's a parking garage, by the way, right across the street. Um, I'll be parking there to be candid. However, maybe for many of you, take the commuter rail. You're going to avoid a lot of the traffic, the congestion. Get off at the Salem stop on the Rockport Newberry Port line. It's, I'm not kidding. It's what, what, Brittany? Three minutes, four minutes, five minutes? Basically a three, four, five minute walk. Uh, and hopefully we'll have a huge rally and we can remove this corrupt judge from the bench once and for all. Okay. You heard Colonel McGregor. Let me ask you, do you agree with him? Do you believe that Pence and Bolton essentially blew up the summit by their reckless comments? Let me just say this. I think there's no question about it that Bolton's comments were inflammatory. Uh, there's no question. They did tremendous damage. I think there's no question about it. Trump now has canceled the summit. My prediction, and I could be wrong, I think Kim Jong-un really wants a deal so badly that Trump is now pulling out of the summit and essentially putting maximum pressure on the rocket man. And rocket man will eventually say, please, let's make a deal. And we may have a summit, just not in June, maybe in July or August or in the fall. Just my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. Uh, this is from 401. You can text us WRKO, whatever your message is, 7470, 70470. Jeff. Pence's statement to Kim that he could wind up like Gaddafi was disgusting and outrageous and stupid. Did Pence want to prevent a deal? That's pretty much what McGregor was saying. What, forgive me, what Colonel McGregor was saying. He blames Bolton and he blames Pence, ultimately. 
Mark in New York, you're up next. Thank you for holding, Mark, and welcome. Howdy, Jeff. How are you feeling today? I'm good. How are you, Mark? I'm all right. I'm all right. Jeff, thank God for the colonel. Thank God for Colonel McGregor. That was an outstanding interview. He said everything I've been saying for the past few weeks on this show. Uh, Jeff, I want that traitor John Bolton and Mike Pompeo and Mike Pence stripped naked and publicly whipped on the White House lawn. <laughs> Brittany, why did you? <laughs> why did you? <laughs> why did you drop him? <laughs> Brittany is Brittany is very uncomfortable. No, is that's just like absolutely ridiculous to say that on air. He, Stripped naked and whipped. Are you all right? It was he was being figurative. He wasn't being literal, Brittany. No, Brittany. Brittany likes Bolton. Brittany thinks I'm being unfair to Bolton. That's not true. I just said to you off the air that I think that he messed this whole thing up. No, I know, but I think you, you're you're kind of uncomfortable with some of the heavy criticism he's taking. I think it's a little unfair. I mean, I don't personally, but that's okay. We can agree to disagree, but... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a figure of speech, Brittany, for God's sakes. <laughs> He's not seriously saying, you know, strip him naked and whip him. <laughs> all right, so, all right, you've got Brittany uh, still in the Bolton camp. Let's put it that way. 617-266-6868. Um, all right, I want to take more of your calls. So let me ask you this. Do you blame John Bolton? And Mike Pence, to a lesser degree, for essentially now blowing up the summit with their inflammatory remarks about Libya. And did they just kiss away Donald Trump's Nobel Peace Prize? I'll take all of your calls, I promise. But first, quote, we are out of the talks with North Korea for now, according to President Trump. He's now saying the ball is in little rocket man's court. WRKO's Bill Trefiro has the latest from the newsroom. Take it away, Bill. Thank you. 137 here on the great WRKO. Okay, my friends, another reminder. Please join us for our Impeach Judge Feely rally. It's going to be held at the J. Michael Ruane Judicial Building on Federal Street in Salem. It's going to start at 415. I hope to see all of you there. Uh, there's a nice parking lot about just right across the street. Uh, we are going to leave right after the show, 3 o'clock sharp. We're out of here. Um, I've got an interview for you at 245. Lucy Kohler, who has been there protesting every day, you got to hear it. You got to hear this interview, I'm telling you. Also, if you're going by commuter rail, uh, get off at the Salem stop on the Rockport Newberry Port line, and then the courthouse is maybe three, four, five minutes walking distance. Okay, my friends, President Trump says it's over. He is canceling the summit with Little Rocket Man. In particular, the North Koreans were outraged over John Bolton saying they want to apply the North Korea model to, uh, sorry, the Libya model, forgive me, the Libya model to North Korea. And then Mike Pence again reiterated that in statements uh, over the last 24 to 48 hours. Look, if you're Kim Jong-un, all you're thinking is when you say Libya, you think Gaddafi. You think Gaddafi getting a spike put right through his body and then being dismembered on the streets by his political enemies and opponents. And the moment you mention Libya with a paranoid dictator like Kim Jong-un, you basically blew up any chance of a deal. And so my question to you is this. What do you make of Trump's decision to cancel the summit? And two, we heard Colonel McGregor in the last, whatever it was, uh, before the news break, uh, he's, he blames Bolton in particular, and he says Bolton should be fired for his reckless, incompetent comments. 617-266-6868. You can text us, WRKO 7470. Uh, WRKO, we know it's for us, the message, 70470. Jeff, General Patton was spot on about the Soviets as well. We never would have had North Korea, Vietnam, Cuba, etc. if he were listened to and not murdered. 
Uh, 508, Jeff, I have a strong, I have strong feelings about this, and I am convinced Bolton and Pence did this on purpose. Interesting. Uh, 774, Jeff, the Gaddafi model was working up until Obama and Hillary took him out. Now look at Libya. Bingo. I mean, bingo. Bingo. He had been disarmed. He had become an ally of ours. And then they invaded him. And they toppled them. And by the way, Libya was handed over to Al-Qaeda and the Islamists, but let that go. Think of the message that's sent to the entire world, to every dictator. Well, don't trust the United States. Don't cooperate with the United States. And if you give up your weapons of mass destruction, the Americans aren't going to hold. They're not going to stay true to their deal. They're going to wait a few years and then overthrow you and destroy you. So th when they mentioned Libya... I am telling you, they kissed this deal away. The only question now is, can Trump put enough pressure and carrots, incentives, to get Kim to go back to the negotiating table? We'll see over the next couple of months. Tom in New Jersey, you're up next. Thanks for holding, Tom, and welcome. Hey, God bless you, Jeff. Hey, Jeff, I disagree with Colonel McGregor. He sounds like he's drinking the New World Order Kool-Aid. I mean, we had that doofus jerkamo John Kerry, and we ended up with that pathetic Iran agreement. You know, Jeff, a wise man once told me, you got to understand where the pressure is. This incorrigible juvenile delinquent in North Korea, Jeff, he's running out of Louis the Thirteenth con cognac and a mental cheese. He holds no cards. Walk gently and carry a big stick. This guy has no negotiation. It should be an unconditional surrender. And I got another news flash, Jeff. He agreed to give up his nuclear test site. I never heard a word about him giving up his nukes. This, this guy is FOS. Don't mess with success. Donald Trump knows what he's doing, and I'd rather have John Bolton every day, twice on Sunday, as compared to that doofus John Kerry. What do you think, Jeff? Oh, Bolton over Kerry, there's no duck. I mean, I, <laughs> Tom, I mean, there's no contest there. Yeah, so why, let's not mess with success. Trump, Trump, he got, he got the political prisoners back. This, this party boy is running out of booze and cheese. Leave the sanctions in place and let them work. They're doing just fine. Tom, thank you very much for that call. I appreciate it. Let's go to another Tom. Tom in New Hampshire. You're up next. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, good afternoon, Jeff. Hi. Um, when you had this McGregor on, I've heard him before, and I, I think in, in, an, in another time, if he had um, any kind of power, he would be the one to fold. And you know he's not he's not strong at all. I think what the uh, North Koreans are doing. They were, I think the second time that uh, Kim met with the Chinese, that uh, the Chinese instructed him that they need to look some, look for something that they can back out or, or try to get um, the United States to give concessions. So they picked on these this phrase that Bolton said. So they they were posturing, in my opinion. And, and as far as uh, McGregor goes, I, I'm just curious. He didn't say anything about the Obama administration. That that deal with the weapons of mass destruction was negotiated in 2003, and nothing ever happened until the Obama administration meddled with the Libyans. So I just wondered what your uh, oh Tom, I think look, I, you're dead on. That, that the last point is, I I think it's almost now almost incontrovertible. It's irrefutable. It's undebatable. Look. We had successfully defanged Gaddafi, his biological weapons, his chemical weapons, his uh, nuclear weapons program. He didn't have actual nuclear weapons, but his nuclear weapons program. And look, to be fair to Bolton, what he was initially referring to was the 2003 model when we lit, I'm not kidding, like literally, we flew in American weapons inspectors. It was an American operation and physically they were hauling out the, 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 um, the whole equipment. They were hauling everything out. So we verified it. We uh, disarmed Gaddafi. It was permanent. It was done. It was over. Now, Gaddafi didn't do it out of the goodness of his heart. Remember, you had the invasion of Iraq. 
and Saddam had been toppled. So Gaddafi said, ooh, with Bush in power, I don't want to go the way of Saddam. So I want to play nice. Now, I don't like Gaddafi. Gaddafi was a murderer and a dictator. But the fact of the matter was, he gave up all of his weapons of mass destruction. He did. And then, I don't want to say he was an ally of ours, but he wasn't a threat to us anymore. He was not a threat to the West. He was not a threat to America. Then the Islamists rose up in Libya because he was a secular dictator like Saddam. And boom, that's when Obama and Hillary, as part of their campaign to, de- to promote and champion the Arab Spring, which led to radical Islam coming to power in countries across North Africa and the Middle East, backed the Al-Qaeda rebels. They were Al-Qaeda ISIS rebels. That's what they were. And they tore Gaddafi on the streets from his, they ripped him out of his Toyota pickup truck that he was fleeing in. And they literally, I'm not kidding, dismembered him. They tore him limb from limb on the streets. So what Kim Jong-un, to be fair to the mad midget, I mean, he may be a cokehead and a drunk and a degenerate, but the guy can watch CNN. And he's like, not going to happen to me. It's not going to happen to me. So the moment they say Libya, boom, in his mind, you know what he's thinking? They're, they're going to dismember me the way they dismembered Gaddafi. I give up my nukes. I give up my weapons. And then the Yanks are going to turn around and foment an internal revolt and regime change. So that's where I think, honestly, McGregor's on strong ground. Now, firing Bolton, that's, that's a whole different thing. All I'm saying is, come on, you want a deal or you don't want a deal? Well, if you want a deal, don't say the most provocative things and then be shocked when the guy says, I don't want to meet you. I mean, to me, it's just common sense. 617-266-6868. More with your calls. Next. Okay, my friends. Historic summit with North Korea has now been canceled. What is your reaction? 617-266-6868. Lines are loaded. Russ in Boston. Thanks for holding, Russ, and welcome. Jeff, I need a little time because I have a couple of big important points to make. Yes, go ahead, Russ. The floor is yours. This general, this, this colonel was right on the money. For eight years, Barack Obama weakened our military, and, and, and he is right. We are a lot more weakened than we was before Obama took office, without question, okay? The other thing is, we are a debtor nation. The only reason why we can do what we do is because the dollar is the world's reserve currency, so we can get away with printing money. But remember, eventually, we're not going to be able to print money anymore, and we can't support these wars throughout the globe. And anyone that turns around and says, we're going to take a strong stance, and we're going to tell them this, and we're going to tell them that, Really, I'm sorry, but you're not thinking straightly, okay? Now, as far as John Bolton is concerned, okay, I would fire him immediately. I would not allow him to represent me in small claims court, and I'll tell you why, okay? First of all, when you're part of a negotiating team and the leader of the team is negotiating, your job is to shut your mouth and and just give advice uh, privately to the lead person in negotiating. And always remember, in, in 101 in negotiating, once you're getting what you want, it's time to leave and, and, and shut your mouth. Because you keep running your mouth, all you can do is, is destroy the deal. And, Jeff, I'll give you an example. Let's say you were up for a raise. And, and you know, showed how much, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, your, uh, listenership has gone up. And basically the boss patted you in the back and says, you're an asset to the company, and I'm going to give you a 20% raise, okay? Now, the best thing you can do is thank them, really appreciate working for the company, and get the hell out of there. Because if you keep talking, he might change his mind. You get the picture? Uh, Russ, it's even worse than that. I mean, it's a, it's a great analogy, but it's even worse than that. It's like me getting Brittany to negotiate then for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? She'll say, what do you mean 20%? She'll be giving him 35%. He, the, the whole station's based on him. And give me a raise, too. And then before you know it, she and I are out on the street. You know what I'm saying, Russ? I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> Russ, as always, really good call. Thank you for that call, Russ. Uh, Frank in Boston. You're up next. Go ahead, Frank. Hello, hello Jeff. Uh, 
first of all, I disagree with the, with the colonel. He's wrong. John Bolton is a great man. He's a patriot. I sleep better at night because John Bolton is actually in government, not on the sideline. I want him participating. Uh, the people who hate John Bolton are the North Koreans, the Chinese, and the Iranians, and the liberals. All one group. All the, all, all the uh, subversive groups. Liberals, right in there. Okay? So uh, that would be a mistake for Trump to fire him because that would show a sign of weakness to our enemies. Keep John Bolton in there. He's a good man. He knows what he's doing. He's been around a long time. So, he, that well, well be Frank, and, and Frank, I mean, just, I mean, honestly, I mean, I understand they're angry, and because this is, a, you know, it was a huge summit, could have been a huge breakthrough, uh, would have been a game changer geopolitically, frankly, even politically for Trump. Can you imagine if he actually got the North Koreans to give up their nuclear weapons? So people so no. are, people are very angry. I understand that, but I mean, you know, realistically. It's now Trump's third national security advisor. You can't just, you know, you can't just fire people every week. You know what I'm saying, Frank? Like, no. th there's a certain point where you're like, look, you're still in your first term. He's your third national security advisor. You just hired him a couple of weeks ago. You just, you can't fire him now. No, you, you can't fire him now. As I said, it, it sends a bad message. Leave him in there. He's a good man. Mike Pompeo is a good man. These people are tough people, and these are the kind of people you need in foreign policy. It was Roden Face Clinton is the one that destroyed the foreign policy by her actions in Libya. John Bolton, as you said earlier, was talking about the 2003 model, not 2011. So people are taking that out of context because they want to get rid of John Bolton, including liberals, by the way. Frank. Thank you for that call. I appreciate it, Frank. William in Fairhaven, you're up next. Go ahead, William. Uh, Jeff, I don't think they would ever come to the table, to be quite honest. We're talking about a guy who was just lobbing nuclear weapon, I mean, weapons into the China and the Japanese Sea. We're talking about a guy who's executing his own people. We don't even know how many mass graves. What, are, what, is they, what do they think, that he's just going to like, uh, give up? You no, know, somebody's going to try him for crimes against humanity. I mean, he has no other alternative. He was never going to show up at the table there. Bolton's a good guy. McGregor, Colonel McGregor, I think that guy is, I think he's been hanging around with the liberals too, thinking long, because the way, he, the, way, the way he was talking about Bolton, you can hear it in his voice, you know. But um, the thing is, if you take a look at Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-il was never going to come to the table. I mean, he was never going to come to the table. You're just playing another game, but the thing about this game is they got something up. Something serious and dangerous is up. And I think Trump and Bolton and all of them know it. And they said we better back out of this because there's no way we can forgive this guy. That's what I think. Well, William, I can just tell you this, this I know for a fact, that the Trump administration, what the president wanted was this deal. He wanted to get rid of all of North Korea's nuclear weapons. He wanted Kim to give them up. Kim through the back channels, was essentially saying, well, you know, what are guarantees that I'm going to stay in power? What guarantees are there that in five, ten years, you know, you guys won't pull a Gaddafi on me, right? Yep. You're not going to overthrow me. And I think what Trump wanted was bringing in the Chinese, bringing in the South Koreans, saying, look, we will preserve the North Korean regime. We will give you a guarantee that we will never try to topple your regime. So mm -hmm. you're going to get the security that you want, and we get your nuclear weapons. Quid yeah. pro quo. You get something, we get something. I think what happened, to be honest with you, William, is when they talked about the Libya model of disarmament, Kim mm -hmm. Jong-un freaked out and said, Libya, Gaddafi. Gaddafi, yeah. Gaddafi, Gaddafi. And then the whole thing went off the rails. Well, you know, Gaddafi, actually, that was horrible. The Arab Spring is a perfect example of liberalism with the power to project power around the world. Look what Barack Obama did to the Middle East. Look, you've oh. got three, four million Syrians. Well, biblical, it's biblical. It's in our times it happened. Often moved from their homes into Europe. Unbelievable. And they're still walking around free. I make this prediction right now. If Trump don't stop throwing those people in jail, they get powerful. Trump's done. And the next time they get in power, we're done. And uh, that's all I got to say. I Jeff. agree with you. Thank you very much for that call, William. Okay, my friends. 617-266-6868 is the number. Next hour, you don't want to miss it. Trust me when I tell you this, you don't want to miss it. Okay, my friends. 
President Trump, as you know, has canceled the summit with North Korea. However, he is leaving the door open with little rocket man Kim Jong-un after pulling out of the June 12th summit in Singapore. WRKO's Bill Trefiro has the latest from the newsroom. What is it, Bill? Bill.